good morning uh, welcome everyone and we will have our first talk of the morning by on her mustad uh, she will talk on uh, she is from upen and she will talk on patterns in nature and human visual perception Right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the organizers for inviting me here. It's really been a pleasure to be a part of this meeting. Um, broadly speaking, I'm interested in understanding how neural systems are organized and why they're organized in a particular manner. And as Bill very nicely put it yesterday, these questions only make sense given some additional context. So it only makes sense to ask why an information processing system is organized as it is um, if we have some information about what functions that system is trying to perform and the input signals that that system might be using to help perform those those functions and so it then becomes important to understand um, not only the system at hand but the environment in which that system is trying to operate and in the case of um, sensory systems like the olfactory system that Vijay was discussing yesterday or the visual system that I'll be discussing today um, the, the space of inputs is the natural world in which we live. And this, this world in which we find ourselves has particular statistical regularities, some particular structure. And so it becomes important and sometimes very challenging to try to understand and characterize the structure of natural signals. And we heard a bit about that yesterday in Vijay's talk, trying to understand and characterize the space of natural chemical signals that might be relevant for olfactory processing. But if we can do this, if we can get some traction and, uh, and have tractable ways of characterizing the structure in the natural world, then as Bill was discussing, we can use this to make and test specific predictions about the optimal organization, the best way to organize a system in order to um, optimally encode or take advantage of structure in the environment. And we heard several nice examples of this yesterday, one of which was in the visual system, an experiment that showed that receptors in the eye are tuned, efficiently tuned, to the distribution of luminances found in the natural world. Now, uh, our ability to perceive and interact with our surroundings relies heavily on our understanding of not only luminance, but complex patterns of luminance, correlations in luminance that extend across the visual world. And our ability to decipher these patterns underlies our ability, for example, to recognize a predator that we might be wanting to avoid. And without telling you right now um, how specifically we might keep track of these patterns or these correlations in light that we see in the visual world, you may or may not be surprised to know that we happen to be particularly sensitive to some types of patterns, and we happen to be particularly insensitive to other types of patterns. And so today I'm going to tell you a story about the patterns that we see the patterns that we don't see, and why we do and don't see these types of patterns. So to start, we, we know that complex patterns that involve um, not just luminance values of individual points in this image, but um, involve correlations between different spatial points in this image, are important for our ability to parse the structure that's here. And we can test that very directly by removing these correlations. Okay, so we, if we take this image and we remove um, correlations that involve multiple points of light, we remove higher order correlations, but preserve expected pair correlations through a process called phase scrambling, we see that the image that we get back is largely unrecognizable. So I wouldn't be able to tell you from this image that I'm looking at bears. If, on the other hand, I take this image and I preserve higher order correlations, but remove expected pair correlations, the resulting image is still largely recognizable. So by whitening the image, we, we see that we can still make out the shape of, of bears, and we can make out quite a, a good deal of texture in the background and in the foreground. So we know that higher order correlations are important for visual processing, because if we remove them from an image, we no longer understand what we're seeing. And so the question then becomes, are all correlations equally important? Should we devote resources to processing some correlations, preferentially over other correlations. Yes, yes. So, so, the, 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 um, so what we're doing in, in whitening the image, for example, is we're, we're flattening the power spectrum of the image. So we're removing um, the average power spectrum. 
And so this removes average pair correlations, but um, preserves higher order correlations. And those higher order correlations are contained in the phases when we Fourier transform this, this image. And so we do the, the reverse here. We Fourier transform the image. We scramble all the phases, but we, we preserve the power spectrum. We transform back. And, and what we get is an image that um, loses quite a bit of structure. OK, so we know higher order correlations are important. What we'd like to know is whether some correlations are more important than others. And so um, to explore this, this is the question I'm going to explore in the talk. And to explore this, we, we formed a particular hypothesis. And I'm going to give you an intuitive description of this hypothesis right now. And then I'll come back towards the end of the talk and try to unpack this a little bit more in terms of, of information optimization. All right, so the hypothesis is that we should be visually sensitive. We should have high perceptual sensitivity to patterns or correlations that are more variable in the natural world. And the basic intuition behind this hypothesis is as follows. If we imagine taking a measurement of, say, a three-point correlation, and we make many such measurements across visual scenes, and this measurement always has the same value, then any particular instance, any particular measurement, won't tell us anything informative about the scene that we're seeing. If, on the other hand, we make many such measurements, and they all have uh, very different values, then any particular measurement could tell us something informative about what, what we're seeing. So that's the basic intuition behind the hypothesis. Testing this involves two very different sets of analyses. So on the one hand, we want to say something about perceptual sensitivity, visual sensitivity. And for this, um, we've been collaborating with Jonathan Victor and Mary Conti at Weill Cornell Medical College, who do psychophysical experiments to measure human visual sensitivity. So I'll be telling you about their experiments. Um, so this is one piece of testing this hypothesis. The other piece is that we want to say something about the variability of structure that we find in the natural visual world. And for this, we want to analyze structure in natural images. All right, so I'll tell you about both pieces, um, both lines of work here. But before we can go any further in testing this, we have to specify, we have to agree on a, a definition of what we mean by correlations. So we choose to define correlations between binary pixels arranged in a 2 by 2 square. Now, there are 16 possible ways of coloring a 2 by 2 square with binary pixels. And we can sample each of these colorings from a black and white image. So we can scan across this image with a 2 by 2 window, and we can count the number of times that we measure a particular coloring. And so we can get an estimate of the likelihood of that particular coloring. Now, translation invariance imposes constraints on this distribution and reduces the number of independent degrees of freedom to 10. And we can parameterize these 10 degrees of freedom by 10 independent coordinates that capture local first through fourth order correlations. All right, so the first of these coordinates is a first order coordinate that describes overall luminance of an image in terms of the likelihood of measuring a white pixel relative to the likelihood of measuring a black pixel. We have four second order coordinates that describe pairwise correlations between pixels arranged vertically, horizontally, and in the two diagonal directions. And I'm going to denote these um, second order coordinates with the variable beta. And I'm often going to use these pictures on the side here to denote that we're talking about a two point correlation of a particular configuration. So you'll see these pictures um, pop up quite a bit. We have four third order coordinates that characterize um, three point correlations between pixels arranged into um, L shapes. And again, I'll, I'll use these, um, these three point uh, pictures to denote these third order correlations and I'll describe them by the variable theta. And then we have one single fourth order coordinate that describes a single four point correlation between all four pixels in this window. All right, so these are 10 independent coordinates that parameterize the space of local correlations. And because these coordinates are defined in terms of the likelihood of sampling certain colorings, if you give me an image, I can return to you a set of coordinate values. All right, so to do this, um, we, we extract these coordinate values from natural images, and we do that in the following way. So we have an ensemble of natural images that were taken in Botswana 
And they represent, um, they were taken from a variety of different uh, conditions. Um, th they involve lots of brush, ground cover, trees. They include no man-made objects. Um, this happens to be um, a close-up image of a baboon, and you can maybe make out his eye here. Um, so we, we take these images and we block average the image by a particular factor, and we'll vary this factor. And this means that we um, take a, a group of pixels and average over that group of pixels. And then with this block averaged image, we divide it into patches of a particular size. And then we whiten the ensemble of patches. And we binarize each patch at the pixel intensity median of that patch. So this binarization process means that we have equal numbers of black and white pixels in each of these patches. So that means that we're forcing this first order coordinate to be zero by construction. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll be primarily discussing the remaining nine coordinates um, because we've, we've removed this first order luminance coordinate. OK, so now we have a set of binarized patches. And again, I can return coordinate values for each of these patches by scanning over the patch with my, my window. And I can count the number of times that I measure each of these 16 colorings. And from this histogram, I can compute values for each of these now nine coordinate values. So this gives me a tag, a vector, um, that uh, parameterizes, that captures the correlations that are found in this image patch. Now we can do this over our ensemble of images. So again, we have many, many images. We're working with a set of a little over 700 images. Each image is divided up into patches. Each patch is assigned a set of coordinate values. And when we collect the coordinate values across this ensemble, we build up a probability distribution of coordinate values. Right? And, and so our prediction is, so in, in this probability distribution, each of these points represents a specific image patch. And our prediction is that the variability in this distribution will be predictive of human sensitivity, visual sensitivity, to the same types of correlations. Now, to test this prediction, we, we have to recognize that not only can we take an image and report back, extract a set of coordinate values, we can actually use these coordinates to generate synthetic images that we use in psychophysical experiments. So zooming in on this, this bottom piece, what you're looking at are examples of the types of synthetic patterns that we generate by tuning each of these coordinate knobs independently. So as you look along the zero line here, you're looking at white noise. As you scan towards strong positive values or strong negative values, you move towards strong correlations or strong anti-correlations. And these coordinate values are each scaled between minus 1 and, and plus 1. And so if we look at, for example, the luminance coordinate, as we tune it up to its, its maximum value, we start to generate white textures, as pure white, as we would expect. As we tune up these second order coordinates, we get um, some line-like structures. The third order coordinates generate these triangular structures. And the fourth order coordinate generates some patchy um, structures. Yes? these, then it's not so hard. Um, but if you want to put in patterns of correlations that allow for many loops, an image, then um, it's not so easy, right? It's not so easy. Um, and so um, what we do, so right, these, these um, coordinates can be tuned independently, and you can then sample colorings according to the probability distribution of each of these coordinates independently. We also do it in, in pairwise combinations. Um, it becomes trickier algorithmically to do that as you include um, more correlations. But in general, you can um, sample correlations that, or, or generate a synthetic texture that has um, a mixed value of, of two coordinates and all other coordinates equal to zero. So that is possible. Is that, is that unique? I mean, we could generate many such textures that would have many examples, and that's, that's part of the process. So we, there's no unique texture that has that. Is, it, is, it, is there even a unique distribution? In, so if I think about the distribution of image patches, if I tell you that I want a non-zero beta 1, all the others are zero, but I want a non-zero alpha, is there only one such probability distribution? I mean, there's, there's many such probability distributions, right? There's... 
that would give you those two coordinates and all of theirs being, being equal. Um, yes, in principle, there are many, many such probability distributions. We're picking, um, uh, each time we sample, we're, we're picking um, a, a particular a texture that is consistent with those two correlation even values. Even but in the third case, I guess I'm not sure I quite understand how you do it. So I, I have four pixels here, right? And I mean, I know how to, I know how to draw that so that, so that I get it right. Right. But even if I do the one next to it independently, that doesn't work, right? Because I could have put the thing out over the, I could have put my box two pixels from the first one and two pixels from the second bucket. So, right, so you start by seeding the edges. You randomly seed the edges. And then um, basically for, for each order, you randomly seed up to the last pixel uh, that's involved in that particular window. And then you draw that last pixel according to, um, to the distribution um, that generates this coordinate. And then with that, um, you, you march along. You, you move your window um, pixel by pixel, and you, you draw the last pixel based on the other pixels that are present in that window. And, um, and so this is something that uh, generates, that fixes a particular value of a coordinate and otherwise um, keeps this, it's a maximum entropy construction of, of uh, Yes, and you march along in, in that way. Sorry. Yes. No, 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 no. Th these are great questions, and please, please um, ask, ask uh, anything. Um, uh, so in this way, we can march along and, and construct these synthetic textures. And, and these representations that I'm showing you now um, sort of represent the full spectrum of textures that we could generate by tuning these, these knobs. But in, in practice, we're going to pick a point on here. We're going to say, I would like a particular value of, of this coordinate. Pick a point on here and generate a texture according to this value. Yes. Not so. We're we are um, not into this analysis. So so yes. This this is um, is very simplified in in some ways. So you'll notice too that that these textures that we're generating um, are very unnatural. You, we wouldn't say that this looks like any natural texture that we've necessarily seen. Um, and they're, um, they're not even grayscale, they're, they're binary. So they don't even um, include sort of a range of, of luminances. Um, but yet, we can make very specific predictions about how these should be encoded and test them. And so that's actually, I think, a strength of this analysis is that as, as simple as it is, it still can make very strong predictions about what things we should be sensitive to, even though we've never seen these particular types of, of images. Um, so uh, perhaps you can convince yourself in looking at these that as you scan from the horizontal line here, either up or down, it becomes easier to identify structure in, in these patterns. And this is exactly what we test using psychophysical experiments. And so the experiments are set up as follows. So we have human observers sitting in a room, and they're in front of a computer screen. And on this computer screen, we display the following. We first display a fixation cross followed by presentation of a stimulus, followed by a white noise mask. And the stimulus itself consists of a white noise background with a structured target. And this target, we can generate according to the, the textures that I showed you here. So we can pick a particular value of a coordinate that we would like to sample. And then we can generate a target um, by drawing from that distribution. And so we can precisely control the correlations um, present in this target, and then we place this target in one of four locations, at the top, the bottom, the left, or the right of the stimulus. And the goal of the task is to identify the location of the target. So when subjects are presented with this brief stimulus presentation, they have to respond with one of four choices, top, bottom, left, or right. And so I think the easiest way to illustrate this task is just to have you guys do a quick example. Um, and so I'm going to present this task to you. You will see a fixation cross followed by a brief presentation of a stimulus, followed by a white noise mask. There will be a correlated strip of texture on this, this uh, stimulus. It will appear in either the top, bottom, left, or right, and I'll ask you to tell me which one. All right, so does everyone understand? And are you ready? All right, how many people saw something at all? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> 
How many people saw something in the top? In the bottom? In the left? In the right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> It'll actually um, become perhaps easier. Okay, um, so one more time. All right, top, bottom, left, right, nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what you were actually shown is a correlated strip of texture in the bottom portion of the stimulus. Now, if you were a subject in this experiment, this would be trial one of 50,000. So I always have to make this disclaimer that, that we're always looking for volunteers. And if anyone's interested um, and is passing through New York, we would love to um, have 50,000 trials of your time. Um, <laughs> but the, the idea here is that um, this, this experiment is repeated many, many times, um, varying the, the specific texture that's used that, that represents a particular coordinate value and varying the types of coordinate values that we're using. Right, and so um, if we do this many, many times, I just showed you an example of a stimulus that had a very strong third order coordinate. But if we were to tune down the strength of this coordinate, the texture, the, the target that we're using, looks more and more like noise. And so it becomes more and more difficult to distinguish it from the background. So as we vary this parameter from a value of zero to a large value, we see performance measured by the fraction of correct responses increase from chance toward perfect. And so we can characterize a threshold level of criterion performance as the value of this particular coordinate for which performance is halfway between chance and perfect. Okay, so this tells us how high we have to tune up this coordinate knob before we can reliably distinguish a particular type of texture from noise. And I just illustrated an example where we can probe this in, in one dimension. But we can, we can manipulate these coordinates simultaneously. And so we can actually explore the two-dimensional space mapped out by any, any pair of coordinates. And we can measure not only along the cardinal axes, but also along the, the oblique axes. And so again, along each, each axis here, we measure a threshold value and we mark it on, on this axis. And then we, we march around our plane, and we do this uh, many times. And what we map out here is, is called an isodiscrimination contour. So this is a contour of um, equal threshold or um, equal sensitivity. And I should have mentioned on the last side that we defined threshold as the, dif the, the distance of this coordinate that we have to move before we can reliably distinguish a target. And sensitivity we take to be the inverse of that. Yes. Yes, so yes, if, if I had shown you that image for a long time, you would have been able to scan over and find that. This, the, the presentation time is sufficiently short that you don't have time to, to scan. And subjects are instructed to fixate on the cross and fixate on the center of the image and not attempt to direct their vision to a particular part of, of the screen before they do this task. The location of the threshold will depend upon the space of time and the center of the Yes, yes. If you, if you vary the, the exposure time, then, then yes. And, and this task can become very easy if you allow um, subjects to search for the, the structure. Yeah. How do you decide on the time? It, it's, it's set to be sufficiently short that you cannot scan over the image. OK, so we can. Um, this summarizes the, the set of experimental measures that we can take. Um, and Sorry, for combinatorics. So, um, yes, that is the way, and, and there's a caveat to that. So, um, we actually, the, the experiment is structured so that um, on half of the trials, the target is structured and the background is noisy. On the other half of the trials, the um, target is noisy, the background is structured. So, it's discriminating structure from noise. Um, but this raises another question as to what if the background were not white noise, but another value of a coordinate. And that's another set of experiments that Jonathan's working on right now um, to measure. Yes, exactly. And, and measuring this, this second thing, measuring a discrimination threshold outward in the, in the space, can give us a sense of how different 
um, points in the space are mapped relative to one another. And so that's an interesting follow-up question that we're exploring. But for the purposes of this, the question is just how far are you, can you discriminate from the origin, which is white noise? Yes. So, in fact, quite a lot of it. But we have to do it. It's either we won't use the environment in taking any large capital and extending it to the home and not much of it, right? Yes. So, um, so what's the scale? How do you choose the scale? Yes. Okay. And so, how does Yes, okay, so um, scale is a, is a great question and, and an important one. And so our solution for the images is to try several different scales. But um, the, this, the important question is, so if, again, yes, if we take the, the patch size to be too small, then we get a very noisy estimate of these, these statistics. If we take the patch size to be too large, then we average over interesting variations that could be telling us something about the edge of a bear or its teeth or, um, or some other property of an image. And so in between, the question is, is there an optimal sampling size? And, and does the brain use that sampling size? So I think that's a very interesting question and one that we're, we're exploring, but that I don't have an answer to right now. Um, and so our, our solution is to um, try, so, and I'll, I'll show the results showing several different um, patch sizes that we, that we use to, um, and, and one of those corresponds directly to the size of the patches that's used in psychophysical experiments. That can also be varied. Um, but, but these are um, scale dependence is a question and, and a tricky one. So these these are the sets of measurements that we get out of the psychophysical experiments, and we go as far as as looking at interactions between two coordinates, but um, but not any further. Yes. I, I don't know the answer to that question if it becomes, my, my initial um, guess would be that um, your threshold would be relatively stable, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. But you are right that time is an important variable and we're not treating that here. Um, that's something that is a natural extension of this framework. And you can, you, just as we defined um, uh, correlations within a two by two spatial window, you could, you could define these correlations within a spatiotemporal window. And then you can start to ask about um, sensitivity to spatiotemporal correlations. And that's another um, sort of follow up on that work that we're planning to explore. But um, we have um, the methodology for, for characterizing these correlations, but haven't yet done some of the experiments. No, please. <laughs> So what, what I can tell you is that human sensitivity to these coordinates is very robust across subjects, and it's re very robust across, uh, across time. Um, so meaning, in the sense that um, if once, once um, observers have undergone a training process, which lasts about three hours, then from that point onward, we don't see any adaptation effects. They don't get better at performing this task. They don't become more sensitive, even though they've seen many, many patterns. And one of the observers that I'll show you has been doing these experiments for many, many years. And her sensitivity to these types of patterns is very stable. And so um, at this level, we don't think there are adaptation effects over the course of the experiment. But whether that would change if we had a different experimental setup where we can actually um, manipulate time more directly, I think that's a very interesting question and ask about adaptation effects. I think that would be very exciting. Um, within the context of, of this experiment, I don't think adaptation is playing a role. Uh, 
Right. Um, I, I think that it's, um, it will likely depend on how strong these, these coordinate values are. But, but for this particular, so the, as an example here, it's very obvious once, once we're just sitting in front of this, even if I weren't to outline this in red, it's very obvious that there is some structure here. Um, but you know, as we tune it down to something, a very low coordinate value, um, I, I, and I don't have the, um, the answer to that. I don't, have the, um, I don't know what the curve would look like. Um, but uh, we want to be in a regime where it's not possible to scan over the image. Okay. All right, are there any more questions? Okay. Um, so this, this summarizes the set of data that we get out of the psychophysical experiments. So we manipulate um, two coordinates simultaneously, and we do this for all possible combinations of um, pairs of coordinates. Okay, so um, what you'll notice from this, this discrimination contour here is that um, the threshold is not circular, it's elliptical, and it's not oriented along the cardinal axes, but um, it's tilted. And so um, this tells us something about sensitivity. It tells us that the, the direction with the lowest threshold, which is the most sensitive direction, um, corresponds to symmetric combinations of coordinates. And the direction to which we are least sensitive, have the highest threshold, corresponds to anti-symmetric um, combinations. So these coordinates are, are interacting, and we um, have a, a particular measure of this, this interaction based on the shape of this discrimination contour. OK, so I'm just going to step back for a minute. So what I've told you so far is that we have a set of analyses where we can extract correlational structure from images. And we have a set of analyses where we can generate synthetic textures with prescribed correlational structure that we can use in psychophysical experiments to measure visual sensitivity. And we can compare between these two very different sets of analyses because we work with a common coordinate system for parametrizing these correlations. And our prediction is that the variability in the distribution of, of coordinate values found in nature will predict human sensitivity or discrimination thresholds to the same coordinate values. All right, so we're now ready to see some results. Um, so I'll first show you, these are the natural image results. And what you're looking at is the variability in, image, in the distribution of images. This is um, what we're actually measuring here is the standard deviation um, as a function along different um, coordinate axes. And I'm showing you the results for six different image analyses. And these different analyses correspond to different choices of our preprocessing parameters. So how coarsely we define a pixel in an image, and how finely or coarsely we chop up an image into patches. So those are the parameters n and, and r. And so what you'll notice is that um, the variability that we measure out is very consistent across different choices of these, um, these parameters. And we see that natural images are most variable um, in horizontal and vertical pair correlations, followed by diagonal pair correlations, followed by fourth order, and finally by third order cor correlations. And the rank ordering of these coordinates is consistent from image analysis to image analysis, which is not necessarily obvious given the scatter here. But the rank ordering is, is very consistent. And so this makes a very specific prediction about human sensitivity, and it predicts that we should be most sensitive, we should be best able to see these horizontal and vertical pair correlations. And we should be least sensitive to third order correlations. And this is precisely what we find. So um, what you're looking at here are the results from the psychophysical experiments. These um, four, four square markers correspond to four different human observers. And you'll notice that the results are, are very consistent across, across subjects. And we find that human subjects are most sensitive to vertical and horizontal pair correlations, followed by diagonal pair correlations, followed by fourth order, and, and finally by third order. Yes? Yes, that's, that's a good question. So um, we, we've done this, um, this analysis for two different, and now I would say three different image databases, and the results are consistent, but these, these involve naturalistic structures, not man-made structures. And so um, you would expect that the, the statistics would be, would be different if we are just looking at a set of man-made structures. Whether or not we would 
see that in visual sensitivity depends on the time scale over which we think this mechanism um, has, has evolved um, or adapted. And so um, if, if we were to be able to do an experiment where we could, could compare somebody who had only ever seen natural scenes to somebody who grew up in New York City and see if there were any measurable differences in, in, um, in the thresholds, that's something we, we haven't done, but it's, it's a very good question. Okay, so, so what we've learned from this is that the visual system devotes resources to processing certain types of signals in proportion to the variability of those signals found in the natural world. And we can take this prediction, um, this, this test of matching, a little bit further, um, and we can look at pairwise combinations of these coordinates. And so what you're looking at are pairwise coordinate planes um, for each combination of coordinates. And we're actually looking at the contours of inverse covariance in, um, in the distribution of natural image statistics. And so this, um, this again makes a very specific set of predictions about human, perceptual, uh, human um, isodiscrimination contours. And when we test this prediction, we see a very consistent match. Um, so what you're looking at here in the upper half of this matrix, you're looking at um, a, a, an average subject. So we've averaged over all four subjects, and we're looking at the average um, discrimination contours. But in the lower half, you're looking at the discrimination contours for all four subjects. And so I should mention that this, this is a parameter-free prediction. So we didn't have to fit any parameters to, to show this match. In the previous slide, we only had a single fitting parameter um, that uh, adjust the, the relative scale of perceptual sensitivity and variation in natural images. So we have one single fitting parameter here and no fitting parameters here. And we see a consistent match between um, both the shape and the orientation of, of these contours to the, the shape and orientation of co covariance in, in natural images. Yes? Um, so, uh, so from, from the purposes of, um, of natural images, um, this comes from the, the structure, the distribution of these correlations in nature. So this is, um, I would say, a fact about the, the, the statistical properties of the natural visual world as seen through this lens. And so um, that gives us, and, and we're in, in fitting a, a covariance, we're measuring an, an ellipse. But why it's angled, why it's not circular, um, is a property of natural images. And our argument is that human sensitivity um, is matched to that. Um, I should say, though, that you know, we are, we are um, measuring discrimination contours using you know, only eight points. So we don't have a full sampling of, of this ellipse. So whether you know, we can get an ellipse that is is angled along this orientation, but we're not finding something that's angled, say, here. Um, so, so to get a better idea of the, the very detailed shape of this would, would require more measurements here. OK, so this, this tells us that the visual system is tuned to both the degree and the direction of variability of these correlations found in, in natural scenes. Okay, so, so stepping back again, um, what we've done is to construct a set of, of coordinates that parameterize local correlations. We use these coordinates to measure something about the natural world, and we use this set, set of measurements to make predictions about how our visual system should be tuned. And we're able to show that the visual system devotes resources in proportion to the signals that are most variable in nature. And so I gave you a bit of intuition about um, how this, uh, why this prediction might arise at the beginning of the talk. We can unpack this a bit more and ask, why should we be sensitive to things that are variable? Why might this be an efficient strategy? All right, and so to, to illustrate this, I'm just going to um, walk through a, a simple um, or a channel coding problem. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the, um, all of the details of this calculation, but instead we'll refer you to the original paper by Van Hatteren and we revisit um, this, this calculation in a more recent paper. 
Um, but let's say that we are interested in encoding a set of signals. And I'm going to take these signals to be, yes? The question about higher order correlation. Normally, if you have a higher order correlation, you, there's a tendency to break it up into lower order correlations and take a product of that and have a little bit extra, which is the real endpoint correlation function. So there's a little extra for that. So can you do that with these? So these, these are um, independent coordinates in the sense of um, the, the correlations that we're generating are, uh, are independent of the other correlations. So if we generate a fourth order correlation that's, um, that's independent, it has zero pair correlation value on average, but it has a non-zero fourth order correlation. And so these coordinates are independent dimensions in this space, and we can manipulate them independently rather than trying to understand how a particular correlation might be built up or explained by lower order correlations. So in this case, they are um, independently manipulable. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, that's, and so that's the connection I'm going to try to argue that the reason we care about variability is because in, in the regime we think that the visual system is operating, um, being sensitive to something that's variable is an information maximizing approach. And so that's what I'm going to try to argue using um, this channel coding problem um, and, and tell you why, why, why variability should be important um, rather than um, it could be the inverse. We could try to suppress variable things, and that's often um, actually uh, a strategy that is used under, under different scenarios. So that's, that segues perfectly into this. Um, so let's say we have a set of, of signals that we're wanting to, um, to encode. And these signals are abstract, but I'm going to take them to, to be the uh, multipoint correlations that we've been talking about. And in principle, we could construct a set of channels for encoding these signals, as many channels as we have signals. But for simplicity, I'm just going to have us think of, of two channels. And so each of these channels carries an independent signal. And we're going to add um, Gaussian input noise to each signal, and then pass this signal through a linear filter. And this filter is representative of neural processing. And in particular, I'm going to think of this, the gain of this filter as reflecting sensitivity. And so the higher the gain, the higher the sensitivity. And then to the output of this filter, I'm going to add um, Gaussian channel noise or some output noise. And then I'm going to constrain the total output power that's allowed to pass through the set of channels. And then the question that I'm going to ask is, Given um, that these input signals are, are independent, and I'll relax this in a minute, um, but given that they're independent, what should the, how should I tune my linear filter? How should I set my sensitivity in order to maximize the information that I transmit? All right, so that's the question that we're going to ask. And the answer to that question depends on the relative strength, the relative importance of input noise relative to output constraints. And the output constraint involves both the channel noise and the fact that we have fixed output power. So in the limit that we have very low input noise and the output provides the dominant constraint, then what we find is if, if the signal variability is low enough, then we shouldn't waste resources encoding these signals. But provided that the variability is sufficiently high, then we should tune our, optimals, our, our sensitivity in inverse proportion to the variability of the signal. All right, and so the idea here, this goes back to something that Bill was mentioning yesterday with histogram equalization, is that we want to, given a, a, a fixed bandwidth of our channel, we want to suppress highly variable, channel, uh, highly variable signals to fit within our channel. And if we're trying to fit two signals, we devote half of the channel to one signal, half of the channel to the other. And that means the more variable the signal, the more we have to suppress it to fit within this half of the channel. And so this is the optimal strategy if the input noise is sufficiently low. If, on the other hand, um, input noise becomes a limiting constraint, then we see the emergence of another regime. And so we see that 
um, there's a regime of signals for which we should tune sensitivity in proportion to the variability of the, of the input signals. And so in this regime, um, we should really think of devoting resources to signals that are sufficiently variable, which we will have a better chance of distinguishing from input noise. So when input noise is the dominant constraint, we want to amplify those signals that have a chance of being distinguished from that, that input noise. And this regime is consistent with our findings. All right, so we find that visual sensitivity is tuned to the variability of, of signals. Here are multi-point um, correlations found in nature. And this, this is a, um, a, an information maximizing strategy in this, this example um, in the limit that input noise is limiting and not output constraint. Now we can take this a bit further and um, we can consider the case that the inputs are actually correlated, so there's some covariance structure to the inputs. And then we can ask not only what the, we can ask again about the optimal um, filter used here, and we can think of that filter as a gain plus a rotation. And so we can ask whether the filter should be aligned with the covariance of the inputs or whether it should be oriented in a different way. And again, the answer depends on the, the relative strength of input noise to our output constraints. And so um, what you're looking at here um, is a heat map as a function of input noise and, and channel noise. And we find two different regimes. In the regime that output noise, um, the output constraint here is dominating, we find that the optimal filter should be aligned perpendicular to the covariance of the input signal. In the case that input noise is dominating, we find the reverse. We find that the optimal filter should be aligned with the covariance of the input. And again, this second regime where input noise is dominating agrees with the results that I just showed you. So we found that human sensitivity to covariations in coordinates is tuned to the covariability of those coordinates found in natural scenes. So both of these, um, the results that I showed you are consistent with um, maximizing information in the limit that input noise is, is a limiting constraint. And so a natural question is, what might be a source of input noise in this particular um, computation? And a natural source of input noise was already brought up, and that's the um, sampling noise. So each of these coordinates is estimated by counting the likelihood of, of different colorings in an image. And this is inherently limited by the size of the image patch that we use to, um, to make this estimate. And so sampling noise is a natural source of input noise in this, um, uh, this computation, and we think based on the results that, that this is, a, is limiting in our, um, is, is a limiting uh, factor of the computation. Now, um, as we discussed a bit earlier, understanding the properties of this, this sampling noise is something that we're still working on. So how, how this noise scales with the size of the patch that we're using, how it relates between different coordinates or across different um, spatial regions of an image is something that I don't, I don't know, but is, is an interesting question and something that we're working on. And again, the question of whether there is an optimal size for sampling these coordinates and whether the brain uses that optimal size is an interesting question. And so just to summarize a set of results that I've showed you, um, we're, we're very excited. We have a, um, a framework in which um, we have a set of coordinates that we can use to parameterize the natural world and to generate probes for measuring sensitivity to that natural world. And we can show that the brain employs an efficient strategy for representing these types of correlations. And so with, uh, with the time that I have left, I'm just going to show you one example of how we're, we're trying to move these analyses forward. Right, so another question that was raised is about the, the spatial variation of these coordinates and images and how much they might change as, um, as we move across different scales or across different spatial regions of an image and whether these coordinates might be informative about different objects, um, boundaries, backgrounds in our images. Okay, so um, just to reiterate, what I've been showing you so far in our analysis is we divide an image up into non-overlapping patches. And for each of these patches, we estimate a set of coordinate values. And I'm going to modify this slightly 
So now I'm going to take a, a sliding patch across an image. And for each placement of this sliding patch, I'm going to estimate a set of coordinate values. And in doing this, we can build up a spatial representation of this image as seen through the eyes of each one of these coordinates. And so when we do that, what you're looking at is a heat map um, that we generate by sliding this, this window across the image. And we can begin to get some idea that these coordinates might be providing some information about um, boundaries and, and objects in the image. All right, so uh, particularly in the second order coordinates, we start to see um, that the variation in these coordinates um, outline some of the features of the bear, for example. All right, so we can, we can ask this question more directly rather than trying to um, sort of uh, study these heat maps by actually taking segmented images and separately estimating statistics in, in foregrounds and backgrounds. And so this bare image happens to come from a set of segmented images that uh, uh, was collected at Berkeley. And so we have information. Um, we have a tag for the foreground, and we have a tag for the background. And so we can isolate the foreground, and we can estimate statistics only from the foreground, and we build up a distribution just for these statistics. And we can do the same thing for the background and build up a, a distribution of background statistics. And then a natural question is, do these distributions differ? So the short answer is yes, and the long answer is we're trying to understand how much and, and how consistent this is across images. So I'm going to show you some, some very preliminary um, findings and, and then tell you that we're still working on this. Um, so, okay, again, I'm going to take this image, I'm going to scan over it with my, my sliding patch, and for each placement of the patch, I'm going to estimate a vector of nine coordinates. And so there will be nine coordinates times the number of patches. And I'm going to plot this, project this distribution into the first two principal components. And so that's, that's what I'm going to show you here. All right, I'm going to do this for a particular size, 16 by 16 pixels, of the, of the patch that I'm using to estimate these statistics. And I'm going to color code. So um, here we've projected this distribution into the first two principal components. Each point here represents a patch. I've color coded the patches by the rough spatial location of these patches in the image. All right, so um, we can sort of see a, a, a coarse separation. Um, so we see the foreground. I've, I've marked the foreground here in red and yellow, um, but I've separately tagged bear one and bear two. Um, and then um, the background appears in these blues, greens, and purples. And again, I've, I've separated those based on rough spatial location. And you'll see that there are some portions of the image that are not being used, and that's because um, for this purpose, I've just neglected any regions that for which a patch can't fit fully within a foreground or background. Yes. Uh, say that again? Uh, yeah, so I, I actually, I could look that up and, and tell you afterwards. And actually, it, it um, so the, the principal components here are computed across the full set of patches, but the loadings on them, um, I don't have offhand, but I, I could tell you. Um, that's a good question. OK. Um, so. Uh, what you can see is that we start to see um, a coarse grouping of, of these um, different statistics. As we increase the size of our patch, again, the, the measurements become more reliable, less variable. And we start to see an increasing separation between the statistics that tag different parts of the image. So particularly, if we double the linear size of this patch, we see a very strong separation between um, bare and not bare. And we, we even see a separation between different parts of, of not bare. And so um, this may or may not be convincing. This is only one image. And so we're currently extending this to a whole set of images. But it's promising in the sense that already, with these very simple statistics, we're starting to be able to separate different features, um, different objects, and parts of objects within, um, within images. That's, that's, yeah, that's a very good question. And that's, um, uh, yes, we would think that there would be an optimum window size. And what that is, we, we don't know yet. Um, and whether, there's a question of whether, what the optimum size is for analyzing natural images, and then what, whether the brain actually uses that optimum size. And so those are two related questions. OK, so this is, this is uh, work very much in progress.
but is, is promising to try and understand how much these coordinates can tell us about um, spatial variation and, and object segregation in an image. OK, so in closing, I'm just going to give a, a slightly different um, perspective or, or outlook on some of this work. Um, so I've been telling you um, about looking at the world through a very particular window. I've given you a little two by two square to look over the world. And I've told you that if we look through this little window, we can quantify um, different features that we see through this window. And we can pr make predictions about what features we should be sensitive to. Now, this particular window belongs to a broader class of windows that are informative about natural scenes. And what I mean by that is that the fourth order correlations that we measure as seen through these windows cannot be deduced by lower order correlations. Now, there's another set of windows that are uninformative about nature in the sense that the fourth order cor correlation can be deduced from lower order correlations. So we can group configurations of these windows based on their informativeness about natural scenes. And we can also generate synthetic textures using windows from each of these groupings. And when we do that, what we find is that patterns that are generated from informative windows generate perceptually salient textures. So it's, it's easy for us to tell that this is not white noise. Windows from the uninformative window set generate textures that do not look different from white noise. And if I were to present this to you in an experiment, this would look, this would look like white noise. Although both of these images have the same amount of fourth order correlation. They have the same amount of structure in them. One of them is very salient, the one that belongs to the informative window set, and one of them is, is not very salient. And so we, we chose this window specifically because it belongs to the informative subset. Because we can then ask how to, given that we have an informative window of looking at the world, we can say how we should allocate resources, um, distribute them to these informative features. That question doesn't make sense if we begin with an uninformative window set. So we can work within this informative window set, and we can measure these correlations that are, and we find that we are tuned to nature, our natural world. But there are other worlds that we might be interested in seeing. So this is what we, we may or may not see on a day-to-day -day basis, but something structured like this is what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's very different from other types of images that we might be interested in seeing. So a, a striking example, I think, is, is medical images. And there's no reason to think that the structure, the important structure in this image, is necessarily conveniently aligned along the coordinate dimensions that we can easily see. And so I think an interesting um, line of this, this work is trying to apply these techniques to other imaging modalities. And if we find, and, and we're working on this, but if we find that there is some interesting structure in coordinates that we're not very good at seeing, or if there's structure as seen through windows to which we're completely blind, then this gives us a principled way of transforming different visual worlds into ones that we can see. So I'll, I'll end with that. And I would just like to thank the people that were involved in this work. Um, so all of the psychophysical experiments were done by Jonathan Victor and Mary Conti at Weill Cornell Medical College. And um, the natural image analysis and efficient coding work that, that I presented was done with, with Vijay, um, Jonathan, and with John Bergulio, who's a graduate student at Penn, and Gashford Tkachik, who runs a group at IST Austria. And with that, I'd love to take any, any additional questions. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So I, I, I was very intrigued with the last point that you said. Maybe the second order correlations that you're seeing in the vertical and horizontal thing is because of the Cartesian grid kind of a thing that you're using, right? If you were accustomed to looking at some other coordinate system, you probably wouldn't. Would pick up something. Meaning that if we um, pixelated our images. Something like that, yeah. Like that. Yes. Um, so this is a good question, and one that's incredibly difficult to test. Our hypothesis would be that it doesn't depend on on um, the specific pixelation of the images. Testing that is in, 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 in images is doable. Redoing the psychophysical experiments for that 
um, is, is incredibly difficult. So we would hypothesize that it doesn't depend on that, but that's something we don't have the results to, um, to show. One more. So the, the, you never showed us colored images. I mean, that's one angle where you could really enhance certain correlations. And so your results of the distribution of picking up second order, fourth order, wouldn't that depend if you actually show? So extending this, so as a first step <laughs> to moving towards color, we're planning to move to three grayscale values. So perhaps that isn't satisfying, but um, it's a move in that direction. And already, once you have three levels, you have um, 81 something uh, coordinates that you have to keep track of. And so then it becomes an experimental question of how, how do you efficiently probe that space? And so, um, yes, we, we would like to move. And, and with, so with three grayscale values already, you can ask questions about um, gratings and luminance and shadows and shape. And so it opens up a host of these, these questions that could be important for, should be important for visual processing. Um, but I think already at the three grayscale level, we can start to ask these. Um, color is another dimension. The statistics of, of color um, is, is a whole other dimension that would be very fun to explore, but we haven't made the step towards that yet. One quick follow up on this. So what is the pixel size? How do you decide that? So um, in the, um, in the images, we um, consider various pixel sizes. And we do that by block averaging the image um, by various factors. And so in that way, we average over, um, average over pic pixels to generate an effectively larger pixel. And for the, we, we block averaged um, 2 by 2, 4 by 4, 8 by 8. And over those range of block average averaging factors, we didn't see substantial changes in the distribution of image statistics. But it is something that, that um, one wants to explore. So our results are consistent at least across that range of, of pixel values. Have you tried to uh, include a colorblind subject in your analysis? Because they might see the world differently. From we, we have not. I don't believe that any of the, um, I believe all of the subjects here had 20-20 um, vision or corrected to 20-20 vision and were not colorblind. So we haven't tried. The colorblind um, person might see these things very differently. Might see the. the they might be more accurate because they have or less accurate. If, if they don't have the additional dimension of color and of focused resources. That's, that's something we, we haven't explored. It would be interesting to see um, if the sensitivities were measurably different or if this is somehow um, more basic than, than that. But in terms of choosing to describe patterns in this way, uh, supposing you were sort of starting from scratch, looking at the uh, sort of the sort of empirical information about how human brain may detect patterns, would these still be the right choices to make in terms of the, the motifs? Um, so uh, or, or, this may or may not answer your question, and so let me know if it doesn't. Um, but these, these are a tractable set of coordinates that we can use to probe the system. That doesn't mean that these are the coordinates that the brain pays attention to. And in particular, we don't find, so, so Jonathan has done um, recordings, single unit recordings in, in macaque, and, um, and the sensitivity to these textures arises in, in cells in V2. And, and so he does not find that these cells are tuned along these dimensions. It's not that a, a single cell is reporting um, the, the, these coordinates. And it's not even that this computation can be performed by single cells. This is really a statistical computation that involves many cells. Um, but uh, it's, it's, there's no reason to believe that these are the axes that the brain um, naturally encodes, but they are an ax a set of axes that we can use to, to probe that sensitivity. I thought the one natural image that humans are fairly programmed to respond to, even as children, is that of a snake. Is there any way of, of sort of testing sort of the extent of response to that? Huh. I, I, I didn't, I didn't um, realize that. Um, when we have, to my knowledge, no snakes in our in our images, although we didn't actually use we didn't use natural images to um, to do these experiments, so we wouldn't have have seen that. But I guess the um, we could ask if the statistics of snake 
are particularly salient or, or particularly variable um, relative to other statistics. And that would, I guess, fall more in this second set of analyses um, about the statistics of different types of objects. And so one, one idea is um, you know, things that are salient, like predators, <laughs> perhaps, or, or uh, natural animals, perhaps these have a certain set of statistics that are very different from leaves and bushes that are not so harmful. And so that's, that's one of the things that we hope to um, explore. But that's interesting about snake in particular. I didn't, um, I didn't realize that. So, so how, much, how much does our brain use gradients in the image to identify objects? That's, that's a very good question. Um, and and I, I don't know. And that's something that we're hoping. So um, for example. That, that's what I thought is the first. Uh, when, when you see an image, at least, uh, when you try to segment an image computationally, uh, gradient, um, um, when, when you apply the gradient, when you c calculate the gradient of the image, the easier it is to find uh, um, edges and uh, differences between objects touching each other and so on. So I thought that's one of the primary ways by which our brain also functions to identify objects, different objects in an image. That's, yes, so that's, that's a very good question and something that this type of analysis will help us explore. So already you can see that, um, that gradients in these particular image statistics so, so one thing is we have to define what we mean by gradient, gradient of what. And what we're looking at here are gradients in these particular image statistics. And already um, using these, these simple statistics, we do see that gradients start to be informative um, about objects and boundaries. And so that's one of the things that we're hoping to flesh out more in this analysis. Um, the, the analysis that I showed you prior to this is more about um, patterning and not necessarily about detecting um, gradients per se, but that's something that we think that this framework will enable us to probe that, and that these statistics, um, our sensitivity to these statistics underlies or supports more sophisticated computations. So the hypothesis is that we build up computations based on, um, the, uh, on these sorts of sensitivities, and that higher level areas of vision can actually um, use these sensitivities to, to help us decipher and parse things in an image. So it's a very good question. Uh, any other questions? If not, let's thank Khan for the very nice talk. Thanks very much.